So, um, unfortunately, one of our speakers, uh, Rima, who's the CEO of the MEF, um, had a family emergency and couldn't make it this morning. So I'm going to give my presentation for 20, 25 minutes, then I'm going to leave and go to next door and deliver her presentation, <laughs> and my colleague's going to stay Craig and handle the Q&A. So just a little, little bouncing chairs there. Um, that was a really interesting poll, and, and one of the things that we need to start thinking about is this landscape of like who does own the data and where do, where do we go with that? And what are consumers' attitudes and people's attitudes and their awareness and what's happening in the industry? And so that will be the backdrop. That's a great backdrop for what I'm about to talk to you now and where we're going to go. So first and foremost, the thing I want to kind of emphasize is what's happening is we're becoming increasingly more and more connected throughout society. You've got tons of people out there, and on average right now, the average individual has somewhere between three and six connected devices in their life. And unfortunately, I didn't have time to connect up the people at IO for this session. But you know, raise a hand, who, on, who has three to six connected devices right now? Phone, watch, tablet, ever? Okay, anybody have five to ten? Okay, uh, more than five to ten? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So where, where are we going with that? Well, where we're going is by 2020, they estimate that the average individual will have about 10 connected devices. And by 2022, the average household will have 50. My, ho my household right now has 75 connected devices. And one of the things that we need to understand is every single one of these devices that we introduce and bring into our lives is generating data. It's generating a wide range and a whole host of different kinds of insights about our lives um, that, will both, that are both enriching our lives but as we're going to dis discuss, also potentially putting us at risk. So what's going on? Data is fueling the modern economy. And often when I speak in different settings, you know, if I'm in an academic setting or if I'm in a government setting, you know, oh, how, how could you be t possibly talking about finance and commerce and sales and, and all of those acti activities? But at the end of the day, it really is about how do we fuel our economy? How do we pay for the things that we want to achieve and, and, and grow an economy? And the point that I want to make is as we interject these connected devices, these digital elements into our life, by 2020, it's estimated that 90, 2020, 2021, give or take, 90% of all commerce, specifically in the United States, if not you know, in, in, in modern and in, in other modern economies, will be influenced by digital. And digital is primarily our connected and mobile devices today. So we're increasingly pulling out these devices to inform us where, what, are we, what are we going to buy, what do we need, how are we going to buy? Where is it? Actually make the transaction of purpose, a purchase either through the device itself or with the device via proximity channels when we ultimately go to a store or invite. Then how do we get supported on that device? And then how do we ultimately re retire that device? It's estimated by 2020, 90% of six-year-olds are going to have a, a connected device or smartphone. So this idea that connectivity and connected devices are, are, are increasingly transforming the very nature of our lives, it's a point that we really need to understand and, and pay attention to. But again, what does this mean as we think about delivering products, services, but not just products or services from a commercial perspective, but even, say, from a government perspective or a healthcare perspective? You know, there's a concept that I, uh, I've been thinking about for a while, and I call it the celestial orbit of products. And what that means is, how do we actually engage and interact with somebody? And no matter what you're trying to accomplish, it takes somewhere between three to 12 interactions to actually generate a connection with somebody, in the case of business language, a lead, to get them to actually start getting involved with your business and or your society or your community or your interactions. And one thing we need to realize is that every kind of interaction, every type of engagement, has an orbit around the individual. So as, since we're talking about personal data and putting the person at the center of the universe, if I put me at the center of the universe, we need to start thinking about what orbit does that product or service revolve around me. So for instance, I have kids, so you know, two or three gallons of milk is the orbit of milk every week for me. I'm buying milk every week, right? If I'm paying taxes, I'm doing that once a year. If I'm the average citizen, if I'm a small to medium-sized business owner like I am, I'm paying taxes once a quarter. So the orbit varies depending on the nature and relationship you have with the product or service that you need to have. Now, if I'm buying a car, the average person buys a car about every eight years. If I'm leasing that car, that orbit will become shorter and it will become three years. So again, the, and the implicate, and then if I'm buying a house, that may be every 20 years, if ever. The reason why this is really important, because if you're thinking about how you're going to engage and service and interact with people in society, if you spend the entire time saying, bye, 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 hear my message, you're going to break down a relationship with them. And you're going to turn that tr relationship into an extremely transactional one, which will ultimately really break down the social bonds that you can have with the individual. 
But so what you want to be able to do, but you need to maintain a connection. So when the person's way out here in your orbit, the transactional and the interaction, the communication should be through support, which Craig can be talking about later. It should be through relationship building. And then as that swings back in, you can start saying, hey, I think you're about to change out your car. Maybe take a look at this and start transacting. So what's, why I bring this up is this is what marketers are trying to do. This is what industry is trying to do as they surveil us in society. Because what they're trying to figure out is how do I personalize that relationship? How do I tailor that relationship? How do I optimize the economies of my business so that I'm only transactionally interacting with you when I need to, but then I'm relationship interacting with you when, I, when you're outside of that transactional window with us? And again, personal data is at, is at the heart of our ability to effectively do this at scale with every individual on the planet. But, and all that sounds great, and it can be very effective. In fact, you know, if I think back in here, so Cisco says, estimates that by around 2024, 19 trillion dollars of net economic value will be generated through this process by more, more efficiently using our services, more efficiently using our tools, we'll generate 19 trillion dollars in net economic value. We'll improve our cities, we'll improve education, we'll improve farming, we'll improve shopping, we'll improve retail, and all of the other aspects of, our, of the world. And in, and in theory, you know, while that all will happen, we, do, we are an existential threat, right? In the perfect happy path world, all of this stuff works out really well. But in general, we're a threat. In fact, does everybody remember or Orwell? I actually think he was an optimist. <laughs> and one of the things that we need to be aware of or consider is right now, all of us in this room and industry at large, we're at an inflection point. Do we want to go live in a world where the Orwellian view of society becomes true, or do we want to make choices where we have more of a utopian view of society? And that's up to us, and that's up to the decisions we make in this room today, in this conference tomorrow, and throughout our jobs in society as we move forward. The risks and harms are real. So for example, there are some statistics that show us that you know, as we interject all of these IoT devices into our lives, 80% of IoT devices have some form of security vulnerability. So for instance, have you heard of like the connected dolls, like the connected Barbie? Well, the FBI last June, or July in the United States, put out a, 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 a public service warning that said connected Barbie is putting your family at risk because she can be hacked and hackers can listen in on the conversations with your kids. You know, one of the most vulnerable points in a household is the baby monitor. Because you hack into the baby monitor, that gets somebody onto your network, and now they can do with whatever your network they want. So there's some significant harms as we inter inter bring these IoT and other connected devices into our, into our set. 64% of Americans have all become a victim of identity, uh, of identity breaches because of these IoT uh, uh, vulnerabilities or because of our misuse of passwords and other types of credentials. And that, and that is cost, it is a tremendous amount of data. We've lost over a billion and a half data records in 2017 alone. Since 2013 to today, um, Jamalto estimates over 10 billion records have been lost worldwide. And every time one of those re records are lost, you, me, every individual in the room, is 11 times more likely to be a victim of identity theft. And as a victim of identity theft, on average in the United States, for instance, it will take six months, 200 hours, and about $10,000 to try to recover from that. So the, the, the harms are real. What else are we seeing? Increases in cyber attacks and security. Um, you know, massive of billions of dollars just on the corporate side, let alone the commercial consumer side, how much money we're losing. And the projected, and the projected losses are gonna be significantly even greater. So as a backdrop to all of this noise, not to mention like the Cambridge Analytica stuff that happened with Facebook this year, we're starting to freak out. You know, people are getting more and more concerned. So Harris Interactive Poll across multiple countries has come out and said 62% of people are increasingly concerned and worried about being hacked. They're worried about the stuff that I've been talking about. 75% of participants say they're more worried about cybersecurity than they are about war. And 60% say that, in fact, they're more, uh, so that's the last one. The second one is they're more worried about cybersecurity than uh, that they, uh, they did over this time same period. So again, we're increasingly seeing more. And then that's backed up by other services as well. Now, if you want to, as an academic, if you go back, those concerns about security haven't really changed. If you look at the data you'll, and from the 90s, you'll see people are worried about their privacy then too, right? And they're worried about their privacy in the 2000s, and they're worried about their privacy now. And you're shaking your head, so you just, clearly you've been looking at some of the data. And so one of the questions is, 
what does this mean? So if privacy concerns have, have kind of been consistent all along the way, but the concerns are actually becoming more and more real, what's going on here? And I think there's kind of three states that are happening. You have the unaware people, you have the aware but apathetic people, and you have the impaired people. So the unaware people are like, ah, eh, I have no idea what's going on, Facebook's awesome, you know, happy path. Mm -hmm. You have the aware slash, and I would want to put the word if I rewrote the slide, apathetic. So research is showing there's tons of people out there, but I'd say that a good 50, 60% of us are like, oh, there's nothing I can do. Google's got it, Facebook's got it, they own it. The conversation you were having, Maria, about interject interjecting this context of ownership, they'll say, well, if Facebook's already got it, why should I even bother? And what people aren't realizing is that personal data, just because they have it, doesn't mean that you can't have it either. So as people, you know, what we need to do is start educating people and getting them away from the apathy and say that if you have it and they have it and others have it, that's okay. Because as you build up your own personal data store, as you build up your own personal database, you will create and enrich value for you and enhance the data set that you have for other contextual purposes. And then you have this impaired community. And this impaired community, and I'm going to give you some data in just a minute, is is starting to wake up. And the impaired, what the compared community says is, I'm aware, I'm not apathetic, but there's not a, but, and I want to do something to protect myself, to gain value from my personal data. Frankly, I have no idea what to do. I don't know how to do it, and it's too hard. And it's and all of these other things that we'll talk about in just a minute. <coughs> okay, what, that I, was an intentional slide. Did I do something wrong? No, no we lost the, the connection. So if you could see my next slide, you would all be applying, and you're like, oh my god, that's the answer to the world. So let's take a break right here. In, in this room, there you go, Rebecca. But real quick, my, you know, quick session.io question. How many people are totally unaware? None? Okay, good. How many people, how many of in this room are apathetic? Okay. How many think you're impaired? Yeah, similar to what we're seeing in the data. It's interesting. So with this in mind, uh, Craig and I, and, and, and through the MEF, which is a study I'm going to be talking about in the next room, um, have been, you know, the MEF's launching a new trust study. So they've been doing a study for the last five years. And as members of the MEF, Craig and I and others have been advising the MEF on, like, what this study should look at and where it's at. And, and uh, the study will be coming out in about two months. So if you grab my card or Craig's card later, we'll make sure we can email you uh, to see the whole results. We did a 10-market study roughly 700 people across every 10 markets, to understand the intersection between privacy, personal data, and trust. And one of the things that we found is that we see going into 2019, and which has started over the last two years, what we're starting to call the grand awakening. So we're seeing more and more people move out of the unaware state into the kind of aware, if not apathetic state, and, and starting to wanting to get into the impaired state. So what we're seeing, for example, 24% of people they, whether or not they're aware or not, we're not sure, but they're taking no action to manage, protect, or interact with their data. Another 42% of people in the last two years have taken at least one action to start doing something about getting involved in managing their data. And then 33% took their first action within the last six months. And this is a global study across 10 different countries. So what we can start seeing is while we are all talking about this idea of managing data and using these tools and taking control, it's just getting started. People are still trying to figure out and navigate their way and where we're going, and so that's why we call next year will be the Grand Awakening. And I'm gonna give you some ideas to where we go. But for those people that are awake, for those people that are aware, and they're trying to think about where do they go, we ask them this question of, you know, if you are likely to take an action on mobile, and this is particularly a mobile study because it's the mobile entertainment, uh, entertainment forum, but we did ask one question, what actions are you taking on your computer and your mobile? And the actions were all but the same, maybe plus or minus 2% on any device. So mobile and computer are basically one and the same uh, from, a, from a behavioral perspective for consumers. And we asked them, what are you doing? And 47% say, I'm trying to protect myself from these harms, from the things that I was just talking about, identity theft being one, uh, credit card fraud, et cetera. And then the other one started saying, I want to, 36% say, I want to manage my privacy. Privacy is defined by being in control of your data. So we now see it just over a, a third of the audience wants to start taking more autonomy and more control of their data. Then we said, you know, what do you feel about privacy? And again, the strength of privacy is increasing. Roughly 54% 50 
say, privacy is really important to me. Again, defined as, I want to be in control of my data. Now, there's other interesting things. So if you say, okay, your, your privacy is important to you, you're worried about these harms, well, do you really want to manage this data? And the answer is yes. The insights of the data are saying that about 63% of us want to take an active action in managing my data. Big number. And then as you drill down, and this is why you want to get the study in, in, um, in, uh, in, in November-ish, maybe early December when we, when we release it, they vary dramatically by country. And you'll find some really interesting surprises. Surprises like Germany is completely unexpected. But I'm going to leave that for when you see the study in a couple months. But what's very interesting from there is people want to manage their data, but then you ask yourself, well, who do you trust to help host your data, help, help actually do this administration? And the wildly highest number is me. I trust myself, which is interesting because we just saw that in the poll. We either, in this room, we either said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manage it myself, or nobody's going to manage it. I find that kind of, I found that kind of curious. Now, if we look at this question, though, we also want to see, okay, if I'm saying I want my privacy, you know, from the very important to the important, you know, about 72% of us say, yeah, privacy is important, I'm going to go and do this. Let's go back to this action element. Have any, have any of you in the room heard the concept of privacy paradox? Yeah? Okay, for those that haven't, uh, a group of Stanford researchers um, did a, a study last year and launched it. And it's been around for a while, but they memorialized it in what they call the privacy paradox, which essentially says, I want to be secure. I want to manage my privacy. But guess what? I will forego my security and privacy for convenience and short-term value every time. Hey, I'll take the $5 coupon. Sure, no passwords on my computer because I can get in there super easy. I'm, I'm, if it's convenient and I'm getting short-term value, I'm going to do it. And there's a lot of ethno, uh, ethnobiology research around why we do that. And it's really how, our, how we have evolved in our human brains and how we propagate our genes. Because in order to take short-term value, and minimize and ignore risk, that allows us as a species to survive and to continue forward. So it's actually, this behavior is actually embedded in our, in our DNA and our genetics and our behavior. But we're also seeing it happen not just in our physical life, but also in our digital. So for instance, we know, Verizon did a study last year that 90% of, uh, 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 of the cause of like cyber attacks and, and hacking is, is misuse of passwords, bad credentials. But the average 43, nearly half of the audience worldwide has one to three passwords. That's horrible. I mean, it's scary. And the reason why is because having just a few passwords is convenient. Right? But that's the first entry point. If your passwords are hacked in one account, the very next thing is the hackers are going to take an artificial intelligence bot and use those same credentials across every website. Now, I'm going to get this number wrong, but it's somewhere around two-thirds of every login attempt on a reta retailer site is a hacker trying to use stolen credentials to break into your account. So this is really risky behavior, really activity. Other people, so that, I like this one. So we've all been talking about GDPR and since we're in Europe, 36% of the audience said, I'm going to enact the right of having my data deleted, but only 7% have actually done the action. So again, the data is showing that the privacy paradox is alive and is well. So these are some of the attitudes and the, and the behaviors and the insights that we're seeing in the marketplace. And you know, I could just leave it at that because this, this conversation was set up with what are people's attitudes and usage. But I actually want to give us some recommendations too. I want us to all think about how we frame this dialogue and where we go forward. And I'd like you to look at these 11 recommendations that I'm going to give you now and have an active dialogue, not only in this session, but for the rest of the conference and going forward. The first one is this. In industry, it, we often will use words like investor, client, consumer, patient, voter, or shopper. We put these terms of convenience for our view to look at the people that we're serving. So if I'm in retail, I talk about shoppers. If I'm in consumer goods, I talk about consumers. If I'm a healthcare pl a provider, I talk about the patient. If I'm a financier, I talk about investors. Well, guess what? All of those are artificial labels or states of being that we have artificially placed on people. What we need to be doing, oops, oh, sorry. What we need to be doing is talking about the individuals, especially in the in the era of uh, uh, personal data. And so we're going by 2020, and if I had more time, we could talk about this. We're going to enter into a new competitive age in the industry where it will be those people, that, those entities that can serve the connected individual at scale on the individual's terms will win. But that's for a whole other talk that we can have at another point. So the key thing is reframe your business as to how do we serve the individual, not some artificial label that I've chosen to place on them. The other thing that, that we all need to realize is the very nature of what's considered personal is changing. 
So, you know, even just maybe 15, 20 years ago, sensitive personal data was my government issued identifier. Um, maybe that you know the key or locked to my uh, to my uh, my bank account or safety deposit box. But as that's evolved, as digital's evolved, personal data, the ability to monitor, track, and surveil my information is all embedded in these devices. And so very simple uh, concepts are becoming more and more personal, like the device ID, because this is a, my device, is personal. It knows when I sleep, it knows when I wake up, it knows where I go to bed. And there's a little side note anecdote, because I think I have uh, enough time to say this. Who, who here has actually opted in for location services? Right, that, you know, good, okay. Good. Raise hands. Who here uses Google Maps? All right. So for all of those that said I opt in for location services, congratulations. For all of those that use Google Maps, you're locked in, in for location services. You've given a company permission to track your location. Now there's an interesting. There's a, uh, some research that's coming out from Nura. It's an IoT player in um, California. Actually, they're in the UK. Oh, they're in Israel, but you know, the guys I work with are in California. And they're coming out with some research in about six months, six weeks. And one of the things that they took noted is, are you aware when you opt into location services, you're not just giving access to your lat long, like where you are now, where you are later, where you are later. You're actually giving access to the sensors that determine lat long, namely the gyroscope and accelerometer. Which means not only are you telling someone where you are, you're also giving permission to when you wake up, when you go to bed, are you commuting? And any, how fast are you going? What level of the building are you on? Because new, new and enhanced uh, location detection services aren't just where are you from here at this point to that point, but they're also mapping internally buildings. So what floor of the building are, are you on? And then longitudinally, all that gets added up. So again, things that we really need to think about is this very nature of what defines personal information is changing. The other neat thing we need to talk about is the value pyramid of personalization. So descriptive data, implicit data, explicit data, contextual data, intimate data, like my heart rate and uh, blood oxygen levels and glucose levels, and such as the new Apple Watch and smart devices will enable us to do. I've heard the new Apple Watch is actually going to have an embedded cuff, potentially, in, in, in an alternative band for blood pressure monitoring as well. So there's going to be a lot of intimate data that will pull out of here. And when we talk about personal data, we're so often talking about these little individual data points. But what we have to realize, it's not... That data is fine, and it's good, and it's interesting, and we can analyze it, and it's all great, and we'll generate value from it. But what we really need to realize, in the age of artificial intelligence, we have moved beyond. And we're going to reflect back in 2010 and say that was the time human history changed. Because up until 2010, we were a correlation-based society. And we made decisions on if, then, then that. If this happens, then this happens. If this happens, then that happens. But by 2010, artificial intelligence and machine learning came online at scale. And so we moved from a correlation-based society to a, excuse me, from a causation-based society to a correlation-based society. So we're now making decisions on probability. So for instance, in the United States, um, the artificial intelligence engine is sitting on the judge's desk during a court case, telling him what is the probability of this person being a repeat offender. And that started to influence the nature of decision-making in society. It's telling society, are you likely to be a diabetic? Are you likely to go get a pound of bacon in the morning and a, a fifth of gin at night? Right? And then what are the healthcare implications of that? These correlations are being then used by the system to determine the very nature of the type of content we receive, the type of offers we see, the type of life that we're given as we interact with these digital services. And one thing that we need to be aware of is that these engines and these algorithms that we're taking up and pulling all of these pieces together is creating a new class of data we're calling derived data. And in the United States, the average individual, every individual in the United States through Axiom or Experian or some of the data brokers, has over 1,500 to 4,000 labels that are placed on them by these third-party companies to which these people have no commercial relationship with whatsoever. And those labels are dictating and influencing the life that I'll have within, the, within society. And one just really naturally big one is the credit score. At what point in my life do I, did I sign up for some third-party company or sets of companies to apply a number to me to determine whether or not I'm allowed to have a loan or not? Yes? You're going to talk about, about how accurate uh, those, uh, those uh, numbers are? Yeah, and they're not accurate. And one of the, John, John, talk to John later, and he's crazy smart, and he's doing this thing called, he's with a company called J-Link that's creating the protocols that will help these companies work together. Um, but one of the points that we want to think on, it's not just about inaccuracy, but it's what does it mean? So, for example, there's a UK-based company that's determined that 
not your not your actual financial it's not your actual financial behavior that's the most predictive of whether or not you're going to pay back your loan or not it's your social score they've actually determined if we match up your social profile that is actually more predictive of whether or not you're going to pay back your loans or not so again we're going to see some really interesting changes that are happening in the world so that's kind of number two is really understand this value print pyramid and what it means to your life and again i've got formulas and value personal information and such, but we don't, we don't have a lot of time. I've got about four and a half minutes left. The next thing you want to think about a recommendation is understand the role of data in society. And one of John's colleagues, uh, Ian, uh, 10 years ago mapped this out. And I think this is still valid today as, as, it, as it ever was. The first and foremost set is the set called my data. Right? This is my data. This is the data I collect. The next set is your data. That's the first party relationship. Let's say it's like Target, the retailer that you're doing business with. And together, my data and your data create our data. And it's a data set that we'll happily share and interact. It's like my relationship with Amazon. Your data is Amazon, my data is me, our data is my relationship with Amazon. And I'm super happy with it, because Amazon gives me personalized offers and great discounts, and that's, that, I like that relationship. But then you have these third-party data brokers that are artificially placing these labels on me, as I've talked about. That's their data. And Amazon starts interacting and buying data from those third-party data brokers. The, the attitude and usage studies are saying, we don't like that. We don't like it at all. But we're totally unaware that it's actually happening. Up until this year when we started hearing about the Cambridge Analytica stuff and all that. Then you have everybody's data. These are the public records data that are out there. And the combination is the core data where all of those come together. And what you're going to find is this map differs in every country and weights and what, where it's important and the flows and the legalities of where we're going. So you need to understand for the relationships in your businesses or activities the roles of these different places of data. The next recommendation is to understand really what privacy is. And there's two sides to privacy. And I've been looking around and if you do the research, like I'm, I'm a marketer at heart and if you look at the uh, definitions of marketing, there's over 100 definitions of marketing out there. You're going to find more definitions of privacy, actually. <laughs> but I found two kind of pillars that I, I like to anchor privacy on. On one side, you have Alan Weston, who in 1967 defines privacy, privacy as essentially sovereignty, authority over self, the ability to choose who, what, when, and where, information about me, whether or not I, I as an individual or I as a corporate, corporate entity or I as some other body want to have information about me flowing. So on one side, we have the sovereignty discussion of uh, privacy. On the other side, you have Daniel Solov's definition. He says you can't define privacy. It's too hard. What you really can do is just measure the harms, evaluate where privacy can be bad. And so this is not a question of that one or this one. It's both are valid. It's two different lenses to look at the topic concept of privacy, the ability for me to administer and manage the flows of my information, but also manage the harms. If you're doing the businesses and effectively doing it, you have to manage both of these things. And so yesterday, too, let's think about the harms a little bit. Because this is really important and why, why it's so important that we're here in this room today. Is yesterday, like 10 years ago, the harm that I could have was it's, it's, an, it's the mosquito in the room, right? Like, I'm not getting any sleep, but that junk mail I'm getting to the mail, the spam mail is bad, the calls while I'm having dinner. Don't like it. It's annoying. But it's not really material. Today, the harms are material. I could have identity theft, my bank accounts can be drained, my reputation can be lost, and it could actually, frankly, lead to death. Because last year in, uh, or a year or so ago, uh, there was a, a high schooler that was outed um, by a commercial entity as being a homosexual. He lived in a highly religious, Bible-belted uh, environment. His dad was a pastor, and he was so shamed in his community, he killed himself. Or you have um, cyber stalking from location. So there are, you know, and, and or my IoT devices. Alexa has been actually already used in court cases to help um, commit, um, identify somebody as a murderer. So this data is critically important, and from a legal perspective, we have to realize as well, these devices can't take the fifth. You know, they, the, the, the data can be subpoenaed. And then ultimately, tomorrow, we've got to start having the value discussion. The seventh thing I want to talk about is the pyramid. We talk, and you talked about this already in your BLT example, which I absolutely love and I'm totally going to steal. Um, there are four, five different lenses you need to be looking at when you look at this. You're either going to look at it like me, primarily through a technologist view. You'll look at it through an economics view. You'll look at it from a regula, re, legal or regulatory view. You'll look at it from a cultural moral view. Or you'll look at it from a political view. The key is to really be successful, you have to look at it through all the views. Number eight. Privacy will become the new luxury good. 
starting next year, people will start buying tools and services to protect themselves. Those, those that can afford it. Otherwise, they'll continue to be the sludge that, fulfill, that, that, that powers the modern society. And then you're going to start seeing more aspirationally, my personal data will actually become a medium of commerce, such as, uh, as Ellis proposes in the zero dollar car. If I spend and pay for the $60,000 car, the $40,000 worth of IoT, IoT data that will get generated from the value of the creation of the car should be mine. If you want to give me the car, then it's yours. So we're going to start seeing a really series of interesting economic business models that we'll review from that. Then um, I can give you a whole talk on how I came to the five-fold path. It's actually rooted, uh, rooted in Bo uh, Buddhist thinking. But ultimately, if we want to be sovereign, if we want to reach digital enlightenment, there's five things that you need to do. First, you need to become aware and understand. Next, you need, you need to change intents and behavior. So for instance, if you know phishing's bad, you need to learn the behavior not to click on links that you can't trust. And so that's going to take a lot of educational services from the marketplace. But we know, this is like driving a motorcycle. It's not if you're a victim of identity theft, it's when. And you already probably are. It's just not a matter of you being aware of it or not. So you need to go get insurance and a professional services. So like in the United States, call a life lock or call an insurance company, 15 minutes, problem's going to get solved over a period of time. But if you don't have that, it's going to be six months, 200 hours, and $10,000 at the minimum. You need to find a way to solve these issues. The next thing is, as a social citizen, participate in government and participate in society to frame these ideas. And then finally, um, you need to, it's, it, it, if you're living in a digital world, it's about technology. So you need to adopt active and passive technologies in your life, and there's tons of them out there. And again, as we've just shown, the industry, you know, people are just now starting to use one or two of them, when there's in fact maybe 20 or 30 that they really need to successfully do this. Now we talked about the uh, uh, My Data Declarations. They need to evolve a little bit. So it's about structured rights going into contextual rights. It's about empowerment, balancing the risk and the reward. It's about going from siloed, siloed systems to ecosystems. But most importantly, it's about making sure the individual has a seat at the table. And then I'm going to leave you with this last remark. It's a lot of things, and none of this is really new. I mean, in fact, we've all talked about the role of personal data is for us to participate actively in society at scale. And Cicero, Cicero even said in ADBC, if you wish to persuade me, you must think my thoughts, feel my feelings, and speak my words. So this idea of having an intimate empathy with people has been around forever. The question is, how do we do that in a protected way to be able to generate value in our digital economies? Don't know. And that's what the purpose of this conference is about. And so I'm going to leave you with this last thought, which Darwin gave us in his Origin of the Species. It's not the strongest of species that will survive, nor the most intelligent, but those that are most responsive to change. The only thing I can guarantee you going forward is change. Peter Hawking said just before his death that more has changed in the last 10 years than it has in the last 100 because of fundamental sciences. I'm going to argue because of what we're talking about in this room today, more is going to change in the next three to five than it has in the last 10. So with that, we're just getting started. Thank you very much. Craig's going to take it from here, and I'm going to go to the other